Welcome back to the Battles of Louis XIV, Hochstedt, and Speyerbach, 1703, War of the Spanish Succession. We are going to continue the exploration of Bayer uh tactical system on uh, Age of Enlightenment battles. This is the second battle in this package. Um, I have done a playthrough of Speyerbach, which I have uploaded to the channel. If you want to go check that out, that was my introduction to this system. I went through the rules and some of my thoughts uh, about that scenario and so forth as we continue the exploration of uh, 18th century tactical games that I've got going on right now. Um, I did want to play this second one because it's a bit of a different situation and uh, gives the Allies a little bit, um, I think, more of a chance. Um, and also, I'm unfamiliar with the Battle of Hochstedt, and I would like to see what it's all about. So I'm not really going to go to the rules in this video uh, very much, um, but I do suggest that if you want to know more about this, if you're coming to this video without having watched my playthrough of Speyerbach, um, you should go check that out, at least the beginning, because um, I give some context around this system. Um, so we're just going to dive into to this scenario. Now, the first thing I want to uh, call out is I went uh, all over the place looking for errata for this rule book because um, if you watch the other video, you know that it's not the most solid rule book that I've experienced. Um, I think either translation or content wise, it's a little shaky in some areas. So um, I did dig around and there's like a page buried on Viavictus's website that has, um, it's not even listed as errata, it's like bonus or something like that. And it has like supplemental material for all of their games. There is a fact and clarification uh, sheet for this game. And one of the things uh, that I actually came across that I've been playing wrong because the player aid would lead you to believe you play it this way is that, and this is just one example, there's a couple other examples where the player aid doesn't match with the text in the rules. So if you look at the modifiers for, um, for range combat, there's this one plus two against flank. Um, and also the typo here obviously is a, is a issue, but um, plus two against flank. This is listed under modifiers cumulative. Then there's a list of artillery only modifiers. Well, according to the FAQ, because this rule about plus two in the flank is written in the rules under artillery, this plus two against the flank should apply only to artillery. Um, so it is a severe mess up that this is placed under the modifiers cumulative and not under the artillery only modifiers. I would never have known that had I went and had I not gone and hunted down this particular sheet online. They do add in this FAQ that you can apply a plus one um, in flank or rear uh, for regular units, but that seems to me like a bit of a hedge and not how the design is intended. Um, so I'm not necessarily going to play that way, but I've been doing this when I've had the occasion to fire through the flank of someone, and that changes some of what happened in Spirebox. I'm a little annoyed by that, that this was not checked and caught, because this should be here. And it seems like one of those things, as someone who's designing a game myself and who has been guilty of this through various rules iterations, had an intent for something, then forgot what the intent was, and it, from a previous uh, sort of iteration of the design, had it and didn't move it over, is what that feels like to me. But that's not the only issue for this scenario. The other issue for this scenario is that we have a lone errant unit that I'm pretty sure belongs to this scenario and not Spirebach. So if we look here, we've got uh, Usan uh, here. This is his French column, basically, who's coming up this road. The Battle of Hochstadt takes place in 1703, uh, three, beginning of the Sp uh, War of Spanish Succession. Basically, he had an entrenched position. He heard some cannon fire from the nearby Austrians. Um, and decided that uh, uh, the battle was underway, so he started marching to the sound of the guns. Well, it turns out he was mistaken, and the Austrian uh, army, which was marching north in this direction, t uh, got word of his advancing uh, column, which was vastly outnumbered, t and turned to fight um, as the army was on the march, and then he found himself in a sort of uh, surprise attack situation. Anyways, Usan's column, all of his units are here. We've got two types. We've got these red units, which belong to him, and then we've got these black, uh, what I... are independent units, apparently, but are also under his command. Um, so there's a, there's a subtle difference, in, oops, there's a subtle difference in the game um, in terms of what that means. But this unit here, these late cavalry hussars, there's a counter for them. They are black as an independent unit, but they are not in any scenario setup. Not only are they not in any of the Hochstadt scenarios, they're Hochstadt scenarios, they're not in the Spirebox scenarios either. The only scenario that uses these black uh, independent units um, is Hochstadt. Uh, so I have to imagine that this French light cavalry it belongs in this scenario and belongs in the setup, but it's not listed anywhere in the setup for either Hochstedt scenario. So I have no idea where it goes or where it's supposed to be. I don't even know if it like it was from a previous iteration of the scenario where the French had these light hussars or they didn't. It's the only counter in the game that I can tell, uh, think I think, that um, is not accounted for anywhere. So either it's a rogue counter that's not supposed to be in the game or it is supposed to be in the game and they didn't put it in the scenario listings. I don't know, but I'm going to play with it uh, because we haven't seen too much light cavalry. Light cavalry here is uh, 
evidenced by this L. So they're not very good in battle, but they are do have some other advantages. I don't know where it's supposed to start. Um, this is the start uh, setup that you have for the scenario. I put Usan here because it's the only way it puts all of these units in command to start with, and we're going to need it because in the first three turns of the scenario, the Austrian army must attack Usan, must move to attack him. They can't be east of sort of this line here. So um, if I put this light Hussar unit that I have no idea where it's supposed to go here, it actually puts this cavalry unit in command, which would have been the only out of command unit um, in this formation. Um, so I'm going to do that. It may, I guess, give the French some sort of advantage, but um, they're outnumbered anyway, so I'm not too concerned about it. It does make mean the setup that uh, when Usan rolls for command, all of his units um, are in his command range, so none of them will be out of command if I do that. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, let's talk about the battle in general. We're not off to a great start here. Hochstedt. Um, so uh, Usan, Usan's column is going to be attacked for the first three turns. I believe starting, or first, yeah, first three turns. Starting on turn two... We're going to roll to see if this giant batch of reinforcements under Maximilian, the French army, uh, comes into the battle. And they're going to come in over here into the Austrian rear. Um, so that is going to sh shake things up quite a bit um, if we're engaged. Um, and there's a variable chance. There's a small chance it happens here. There's a bigger chance here. And then automatically, I think on turn four, they're going to come in. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds and, and what the Austrians plan to do. Um, the Austrians, like I said, um, are just limited in that they cannot be east of this line of units here. So they can leave some in, in reserve uh, in case they are worried about uh, getting approached quickly. Um, but they do need to make some sort of attack against Usan, the rules say. It's a little nebulous, but I'm going to go by the spirit of the rules rather than the wording. Additionally, the Austrians have this baggage train. This baggage train involves uh, is related to the victory condition. So we're going to see very similar victory conditions to Speyerbach. You're supposed to, you want to demoralize the enemy army without being demoralized yourself. And in this battle, the French need to destroy at least half of these in order to win victory. The Austrians need to keep all of the baggage train units intact um, in order to win victory. Otherwise, it's going to be a draw. These baggage train units move two hexes a turn. They can't be stacked with, and they're going to move in general towards the exit hex, which is up here. So as you can see, it's going to take quite a while to get that baggage train um, into a safe position. And uh, the Austrians are going to have to kind of protect the flanks uh, for those baggage trains. Um, we've got a creek line here, a stream uh, line there that should be a pretty defensible spot. And then the other way, the stream continues down here, might be a defensible spot for the, the French reinforcements when they enter uh, uh, the game as well. So uh, we're going to get started with Hochstedt, uh, Battle of Hochstedt here. And uh, this is going to be a 10-turn scenario. may call it sooner if it appears very lopsided. But uh, as you saw in Spirebach, um, it's a pretty decent uh, simulation of uh, linear warfare. No combats on turn one, just uh, the maneuver um, as these uh, formations approach each other. Uh, Usan managed to get some sort of line going here across this field. Um, you can see that there's a couple uh, divisions of, uh, or corps, I guess, uh, probably divisions, of um, Austrian units. We've got Palfi and von Anhalt coming in from the east. Um, this is cavalry, this is infantry. Usan wanted to get his units kind of set up, uh, make sure they could meet that advance. Um, and then here uh, we had, who was this? This was uh, Schulenberg. Uh, Schulenberg's Austrian infantry crossing this creek here caused a fair amount of disorganization. Um, you have to roll when you cross um, a stream to see if you go into disorganized mode. It's not a huge deal because they'll be able to rally at the start of this turn anyway, and the Austrians have initiative. But they did get disorganized across there. We're bringing up some artillery and uh, the trains moving through Unterglau. Unterglauheim um, on the way. Uh, we did sort of put this cavalry um, here, Maximilian, not to be confused with Maximilian II, who's the commander of the French army, it's a different Maximilian, um, just along the side of this creek here to prevent any sort of interdiction of the supply train movement. Um, and we wanted to keep some of that cavalry facing east because we know the French are in the area, they might be approaching from this direction, and to protect the supply trains for when that happens. So we've got a nice cavalry screen growing here on the north side of this creek protecting um, the baggage train advance and, and the flank while the rest of the army is going to try and engage Usan quickly before they're going to have to swing around and um, face the majority of the French army coming on the map. Speaking of that, let's see if we get the French army coming on the map this turn. We need, if we roll a six, <laughs> they come on this turn, which we did. So there we go. We get an early arrival of Maximilian's French um, coming on this edge of the map. That's bad news for the Austrians. I uh, didn't expect them to be here so fast. This is, uh, I guess, Maximilian, Prince Maximilian uh, getting a, a stolen march uh, up to the battle. Let me set them up and show you what that looks like. So again, we come to just like an absolute failure of the rules to describe exactly what they mean. Um, 
we've got uh, Arco's cavalry here and Villar's uh, infantry here. And then obviously we've got uh, another cavalry here, Lanyon up here. So uh, Lanyon, I can pretty much figure it out. It gives you the hex range uh, of where they're going to appear. I decided to put them here. That hex range overlaps with Villar's infantry hex range. So I'm not sure if you can intermingle them. I kind of don't want to. So I didn't. I moved the cavalry as far north as I possibly could and the infantry taking the center. Unfortunately for Arco and Villar, it says... They arrive on the specific hex range in two lines. I have no idea what two lines means. There's no, there's no such concept in the game. I don't know if that means stacked, meaning there's like double depth um, in a hex. But if that's what that means, most of Villar's units cannot actually stack because there's a stacking limit in clear terrain of 10 strength points. And most of his units have more than five. So you can't actually stack the units uh, if that's what it means. So I, I have to assume it does not mean stacked. But two lines, does that mean two columns, like, uh, like you know, two, like, in two hexes coming onto the map? Or does it mean a front line and a back line? The rules have no information about that, and they don't say what exactly that means, so I have no idea. I'm going to assume it means they arrive in lines like this, and that some of the units are going to start one hex further in from the map edge. But again, a complete failure of the rules to describe what exactly they mean, and they really needed an editor to go over this entire rule booklet, an English-speaking one and to play the scenarios to figure out what exactly is going on here. So I guess we're just going to do two lines like this. We've got a, a line of, of uh, light uh, of dragoons here, and then a line of, of uh, shot cavalry here. Got a line of infantry, and then a back line that's got the artillery and some more infantry units, plus Velar and some grenadiers. Uh, that's my best guess. But if, uh, if you've played this or you are the designer and you know, I would love to know exactly what you mean by that. It does give the French a little bit of a heads up if I play it this way because uh, they got an extra hex of movement, essentially, uh, here in this, uh, this go. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is where we are now with the French on the field. This is the scene of chaos uh, at the end of the second hour of the game. Uh, the Austrians are basically being pincered from both sides the unexpected arrival of Maximilian has thrown everything into disarray. The very first thing that happened is uh, the oncoming French army rushed forward. We had our first cavalry engagements up here around the town, disordered some of uh, the Austrian cavalry there. Uh, we had an infantry under uh, Anhalt taken in the rear. It's artillery eliminated by a cavalry charge. They're scrambling to get turned around to face what's going on behind them. We had uh, the uh, the Austrian center infantry kind of wheel around one half of the line moving this direction to just kind of disrupt uh, or protect against Usan. The other half turning south to try and take someone in the flank and hold this this creek line. I think if the Austrians lose that creek line, then I think the game is pretty much over. So we're off to a really bad start disadvantage for the Austrians. These cavalry, again, splitting their attention forward and backwards as the oncoming wings of the army uh, threaten to envelop them. And uh, we had our first infantry clashes here with no real effect other than some disorder to uh, Anhalt's uh, infantry. Basically, the Austrians are in a real tough spot and they are essentially just trying to find a place where they can disrupt the French advance somewhere so they can begin to extricate themselves and try and make it off the map uh, up in here to hopefully avoid becoming demoralized. The other problem is that uh, the first uh, baggage cart from the baggage train has been destroyed. So the Austrians can't even win the scenario anymore. All they can hope for is a draw. So I suspect this game will end before we get to 10 turns, um, just because of the utter disorganization that the quick advance of Maximilian's French um, have instituted onto the battlefield. Uh, they are, it's just so, <laughs> it's so scrambly and panicky for the Austrians here to just try and find some sort of um, stability uh, in the forces as they get crunched uh, on two sides. Well, at this point, the Austrians are just trying to make the best of a horrible situation um, as they get enveloped from two sides. Um, they've kind of formed up in, in rows, kind of facing in two directions as the French cavalry wheels around from the south. Uh, not a great situation. Some of the cavalry staying behind to try and blunt that advance, but it's probably going to be to their destruction. Um, while Palfi's, Palfi's trying to get his cav cavalry out of there, he's trying to extricate... Um, his cavalry uh, up this kind of narrow channel up this direction that the uh, Austrians have created in line somewhat um, trading some fire back and forth with the French. You can see some disorders there, some cavalry disorders uh, against the French, but uh, it's probably not going to last very long. Um, and the French are going to go first on this upcoming turn. Um, we'll see what happens. I did forget to move the trains this turn. One, two, one, two. We had another train destroyed. So over here by the French, so the only thing really helping the Austrians on the east is that there's a bit of a traffic jam with the French infantry, uh, but the cavalry is about to swing around and cause some real damage, I think. 
This may be a lost cause. We're only uh, three hours into the battle. Uh, I'm looking at the rules again. Um, I'm thinking that maybe before the game starts, you're supposed to roll to see what turn the reinforcements come in. Um, if so, that'd be a little gamey. That'd be weird. Um, um, so I did it when the turn first check came up. The rules don't say one way or the other, um, but it seems to imply that you roll before the game starts. Um, so maybe I would have done things differently had that been the case, but I also feel like, you know, not knowing when reinforcements show up until they show up is probably more realistic. Um, I'd be curious to see how this scenario balances if you go with the default arrival, which I believe is turn four. Uh, there'd be a lot of, a lot more, uh, possibility for the Austrians to get the baggage off the field and to really, uh, at least kind of damage, uh, Usan's core. Usan, by the way, is, uh, really formed up now. He's gotten organized. Um, and he's in a really good spot to kind of pincer uh, the Austrians. So we will continue playing. Not sure I'm going to make it to the end. Uh, and then uh, I'll have my final thoughts. A little bit of a different perspective. Uh, end of turn four, 11 a.m. turn. Um, the Austrians actually did a pretty good job of holding the French advance off. They're giving ground slowly. They're taking losses because of it. Here's some cavalry that's taking some losses. they got a disorganized line of Austrian infantry here. But uh, they have managed to get the baggage train um, out kind of from harm's way for now. They got some artillery on the way out. They're basically just trying to slowly withdraw up this road. And these, this cavalry unit here um, outside of Weilheim is actually plugging the hole um, on sort of that right flank for the Austrians. Uh, and the French are just kind of getting, you know, gummed up along these two lines of advance while the Austrians retreat. Um, so it's a pretty good turn. I don't know if it's going to hold. Um, the French outclass, and they've been getting really good die rolls as well, the French have, but they kind of outclass the Austrian troops in, in most areas. Uh, and with this cavalry now swinging around down here, they're going to cavalry charge right up uh, in this direction, which is why you can see sort of the Austrian infantry kind of turning the line to face that charge. Um, so it could all come unraveled here, but... Uh, you know, we're trying to make the best of it, trying to be as orderly and tough to defeat as we possibly can, given the circumstances. The battle is not going well <laughs> for the Austrians, uh, as you can tell by just how much of a chaotic mess this battlefield is. There's like no structure, certainly not on the Austrian end. Everyone's retreating back this way in a giant crowd. The cavalry's pulling back. Um, what happened last turn? Well, the French really put the hurt on um, von Anhalt's troops, eliminating four, uh, four infantry units, four regulars, and uh, a cavalry unit from Palfi. Uh, so we've got a demoralized formation. We've got another formation that's likely going to be demoralized after this French turn, uh, just given the position of everything here and how difficult it is. We're going to probably lose that guy. This guy couldn't get away. We're going to lose him. Um, they're basically staying behind to cover the retreat. Not very well. Um, so we're starting the 1 p.m. turn, which is sort of halfway through the game, but I'm going to call it here because... This is going to be a French overwhelming victory, and there's no reason to play out all of the uh, fire combats and whatnot from the French when we know what's going to happen. I mean, I guess we could see how bad of a route it is, but it's already a route. So the French have destroyed two of the baggage trains. They've uh, demoralized the formation that's not coming back from that. Uh, so it's already a French victory, and it's only going to be more of a French victory if we keep going. Um, so, yeah, so that's Hochstedt. Uh, this is the first battle uh, in this package uh, from the battles of Louis XIV. Um I still kind of have the same feelings as I did about the system uh, from the Spirebach battle. Um, I thought Spirebach was maybe a little more interesting, um, but less interesting from a terrain perspective. And this one, I'm a little bummed that I got the reinforcements on turn two. I would have liked to see what the Austrians could have done um, with a couple more hours of attack against Usong uh, while he was kind of disorganized. Um, I would say for both battles, they do feel a little scripted. It's going to be tough if you're not the French player to win. Uh, now, maybe with better tactics than I have, you can figure out some sort of way to do it. But again, linear warfare in open fields, um, you're not going to be doing a lot, of, a whole lot of maneuver um, for the most part in these games. So once the battle is locked in, you're kind of relying on die rolls um, for your troops to perform well. And uh, in both scenarios, actually, the French, uh, I would say, overperform statistically in terms of their die rolls. Um, I... I guess my thoughts on the system now that I've played two battles is I like it, but I don't love it. Um, it kind of occupies the same space as Jure de Gloire uh, in terms of like the scale, the, uh, certainly the art and, um, you know, the types of mechanics you're going to find in here. Um, 
I think, you know, compared to some other games of this era, Cavalry feels a little too powerful, um, given that they are allowed to uh, attack. They, they have so much maneuverability, and they can attack kind of anyone. So it's much different than in Piacenza, for example, where Cavalry could not enter infantry zones of control, which, as far as I understand, is more, more historically accurate. Um, they do have to take defensive fire from the infantry, but a lot of the time that didn't necessarily matter. Um, and so you, you feel like you've got your cavalry sledgehammer uh, anytime you've got more than the opponent, and um, that feels maybe more Napoleonic than it does Age of Enlightenment to me, but that's just a, might be a personal taste. Um, but that said, I do think the fire the reciprocal fire mechanics are pretty good. Um, you know, the way that it incentivizes uh, line formation in terms of, like, not getting flanked and whatnot. Again, it's not... Impl it's not specified by the rules but it's kind of implicit in terms of playing well um i do like the you know obviously i talked about in the last video the fire charts the shot combat table is kind of interesting as well you get um results for both defender and the attacker except on the extreme ends um what else can i say uh i would say that of the two battles i enjoyed uh spirebach more than hochstedt but again that was colored by the fact that we got our reinforcements for the french pretty early um i could see this playing out maybe a little differently um if that doesn't happen um, then it becomes more of a, an orderly withdrawal for the Austrians, way more orderly than we see here. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, like, I'm, I like it, don't love it. Um, I would play more, for sure. There's battles from the Seven Years' War in this system as well. And um, I do hope they keep releasing them. Um, I don't know that I would get to the table super often, but it is nice to have a battle system uh, with so much content uh, from this era. Uh, I'm still searching for that, like, real, like, perfect fit for me. Um, got a couple of options. I'm, I'm excited about a couple of those. Um, and sort of this project of sort of looking at Battles from the Age of Reason, not the system, but just in general, um, is kind of ballooned. And there's a couple more titles I want to check out before I kind of like render my verdict. But um, I would say that, uh, you know, um, if you're curious about this, see if you can pick up one of the magazine battles uh, from the Seven Years' War from previous Via Victus uh, uh, issues before you necessarily maybe go uh, into like some of the bigger, uh, folio packages or play it with a friend and see if you like it. Um, there is stuff to like here. Uh, it's just, there's also some stuff that feels slightly off to me. Um, and it feels very similar to Jour de Gloire. And I would say you probably don't need both. Like, un unless you're really specifically like a, a Age of Enlightenment fan, then I would say you probably enjoy this more than you would Jour de Gloire. But I think Jour de Gloire is probably a little bit better of a game. Um, especially because it's much more supported, um, and it's got very similar visual appeal to it. So anyways, that is uh, my look at this series. Um, we're going to try, we're going to stay in the War of Spanish Succession for the next one. And we're going to go to uh, Blenheim. And it's not from uh, a new game, but it is one that looks very unique.